good evening doctors welcome to this webinar series basics in neurosciences organized by park clinic and dg neuro <clears throat> today's episode is landmarks in the history of neurosciences we are very happy to carry this webinar series and you must have enjoyed our last webinar series which was conducted by indian society of pediatric neurosurgery with park clinic and diginiro uh, in the first uh, wave of uh, pandemic uh, we utilized the time to upgrade and update ourselves and we carried a series how i do it by masters i am very happy to tell you that series was very very successful the total audience for the series uh, we got 1671 doctors viewing this series and after that we got youtube views of 1033 doctors so after this successful webinar series we are uh, proud and privileged to bring you uh, yet another series from dg neuro a digital initiative by health and you a joint venture with newlin company limited japan let me take few minutes to introduce to you our products uh, all these webinars are available on our youtube uh, channel if you uh, type in dg neuro on youtube you will get a host of resources on neurology and neurosurgery till now 56 dg neuro webinars 11 plus international speakers 60 plus national speakers 1200 plus view hours and 11000 audiences have viewed this uh, uh, the series webinar series in our dg neuro channel we have for epilepsy brinda brevercetam 25 50 75 100 we not only give the product brinda that is brevercetam but we also give an app first time in the country ask brinda which will give your patients uh, the next doctor visit which will remind your patient for the next pill to be taken which will give a uh, basics of uh, seizure that they have and it also gives a seizure diary diary electronic seizure diary which they can maintain and then can email it to you or show it to you in their next visit it also has uh, the caregiver group Uh, meeting they can go on to the caregiver group group through this uh, ask brinda app we uh, had the privilege to launch the first time in india 2.5 mg strength of clobazam add clobaz 2.5 5 and 10 for down titration up titration or brd dosing add clobaz in epilepsy we were the first to launch amitriptyline plus mecopolamine combination in headache and migraine management it also is the first choice of european neurologist intention type of headache and right 5 10 and 25 we are also first to launch a vitamin therapy for migraine brentamin it contains riboflavin 400 mg riboflavin 200 mg magnesium 200 mg and coq10 a vitamin therapy for migraine as a add on to your conventional migraine therapy it will add to the efficacy we were the first launch amitriptyline plus propranolol combination which is often co prescribed together to improve compliance of your patient amnuride beta 520 er amnuride beta 1040 er you know that naproxen is hydrophobic it takes time to act when you give naproxen dompradorn combination to migraine patient so we have solved this problem we have coated naproxen hydrophobic molecule with a rapid acting particle which is hydrophilic so your patient get 99% dissolution of naproxen in just 30 minutes giving rapid action and rapid relief ndrap 500 and ndrap 250 of course amnurite amitriptyline mecopolamine combination can be also used for diabetic peripheral neuropathy 5 10 and 25 in amnurite p moderate to severe pain we have made pregabalin in a sustained release form to match pharmacokinetic profile of amitriptyline which is once a day pregabalin made once a day by a 24 hours release pattern amnurite p for moderate to severe neuropathic pain and for vertigo management we have a different salt beta histin methylate not beta histin hydrochloride beta histin methylate the only brand available in india which gives 25% less dose methylate 6 and 12 for higher efficacy that's about it i have now great pleasure and it is my privilege to introduce uh, someone who has conceptualized this 
uh, entire webinar series, the first one and the second one, uh, none other than Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, the professor and uh, doctor in pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, he heads the, 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 the neurosurgery in a park clinic and he has been the ex-president of uh, pediatric neurosurgery of India, a very well-known uh, figure in India and abroad. And I have great pleasure in handing over the session to Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee now, uh, how he conceptualized the session and how he's going to unfold it in the uh, episodes to come. And Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, over to you. Good evening and welcome from the Park Clinic in Kolkata. As we bring you this new series of webinars entitled Basics in Neurosciences. From the exotic, the esoteric, and the exaggerated views of complexities in neurosciences to which we've been subject in webinars for the last year and a half, we want to bring you the beauty and brevity of the basics in neurosciences. And that's the purpose of this series called Basics in Neurosciences. And no better place to start than history and no better historian available in this country to talk about neurosciences than Professor Sunil Pandya. Welcome to this new series of webinars, 7.30 p.m. every Thursday for the next 12 Thursdays, you will be able to witness Basics in Neurosciences. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Dr. Koshik Shiel, who's consultant neurosurgeon at the Park Clinic, a very well-known pediatric neurosurgeon, member of the executive committee of the Association of Neuroscientists of Eastern India, associate professor of neurosurgery at the KPC Medical College. And Koshik will introduce the stalwarts for today and take this webinar forwards. Koshik, all yours. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Thanks for sorry, your kind introduction. Today, our topic is the landmarks in the history of neurosciences. And to start this topic, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our most respected speaker, Professor Sunil Pandya. As you know, Professor Sunil Kumar Pandya is the most senior most and one of the most respected neurosurgeons of this country. He has been a faculty and HOD of neurosurgery at the KEM hospital for a long time, with his main area of interest being on aneurysms and AVMs. He is currently an honorary consultant, uh, a neurosurgeon at the Joslo Hospital, Mumbai. He has numerous research uh, paper, numerous citations, numerous reads, which I will not elaborate. But his quasi neurosurgical literature is one what to binge on. He has numerous publications that is parallel, runs parallel to the, new top, uh, to the hardcore neurosurgery topics. And he is the most acclaimed <coughs> medical historian recognized by NSI in this country. He is a widely traveled person and a widely recognized world, worldwide. And it is indeed our great pleasure to have as a speaker, distinguished speaker in today's evening. I also take this opportunity to introduce our two respected panelists. One, our own Professor Manoj Kumar Bhatcharya. He is the senior most, but the most youngest neurosurgeon of this city. He is an ex HOD at the Bangood Institute of Neuro uh, Neurology for a long time. And he is a current HOD of neurosurgery at the Park Clinic, Kolkata. Along with him, sharing the panelist desk will be Professor Kalanbhato Bhattacharya. He is an ex-HOD of Neurology at Ajikor Hospital, uh, Calcutta, and, cur and currently is working as a chief consultant and the chief advisor in neurology at the Medical Super Specialty Ho Hospital, Kolkata. Welcome to the program, sir. And now I'll request Professor Kalanbhato Bhattacharya to invite Professor Pandya to the show. Thank you, uh, Koshik. Of course, I will invite Professor Pandya. He is a speaker. But before that, I would like to say a few words about him. I'm not a neurosurgeon. There's very little scope for me to have any 
discussion, any kind of interaction with him in his chosen subject. But if my memory doesn't play false, uh, it was in the mid 1980s, 85, 86, when I was contemplating for my entrance into DM neurology, I chanced upon a volume of the CME books, uh, which was brought out every year by NSI, still brought out. And that one was a, quite a voluminous one, and it was a red cover. He was the editor of that in all likelihood. <clears throat> so that's the first time I came to know about him. But what strikes me, and it's still vivid in my memory, he was once invited by the Association of Neuroscientists of Eastern India, most probably to Guwahati, or maybe Dibrugara, in 1999, as a guest speaker. And I listened to his talk. I have forgotten the title of his talk, but what I remember is that it had got something to do with death. You know, critical care was, critical care medicine was, uh, that was almost, not the beginning, but uh, we were into critical care medicine, intensive care, so on and so forth for a long time. So one line in one of his slides, even now I remember, and often I think about it, he said, but death is not the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of birth. Now that struck me as something very, very sensitive and very, very crucial in our understanding of what life is. Yes, death is not the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of birth. And he also alluded to one or two statements of uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramhansa Dev, and he said, the talisman, that slide also I recall. Later, in 2016, when the Indian Academy of Neurology had been organizing the annual conference in Calcutta, that I happened to be the organizing secretary, and there was a history session which I tried to introduce into Indian Academy because of my own very deep interest in history of neurology. And I used to speak almost in all the annual conferences of uh, NSI on the history session. I had a talk that in spite of my busy schedule, I decided to talk on Huntington's disease, on Huntington himself and the disease, the, the fabulous story of the, the Maracaibo story of Huntington's disease. Now, while I was talking, I was amazed to see Professor Pandya in the hall. Now, I think he was the only neurosurgeon in the conference who came from outside Calcutta. I was really surprised to see him. So nobody comes for Indian Academy meeting, no surgeon, I mean, from outside. And after that, Professor Pandya sent me a letter very graciously. And he told me that he liked my paper very much, my talk very much, and he wanted to interact with me. And we started interacting. Now, that was a very, very difficult time in my life. My father was in his deathbed, which I told Professor Pandya, and he was all the time trying to console me and trying to encourage me, trying to give strength to me. Um, incidentally, when I lost my father in the ICU, I also informed him. But after that, we never met. Sir, do you remember these events? Yes, very much so, very much so. And I remember the talk which you gave, which was an outstanding talk. So that's how I knew Professor Sunil Pandya, and I have my deep regards for him. I don't know anything about neurosurgery, but as far as history is concerned, he's, he's simply superb. If I say the word superb, I think it's not the statement. So these are the few words I wanted to say. I will not speak much because of the constraints of time. And, uh, May I request Professor Monin Patechaji Monosa to say a few words you've already said, but please introduce him, invite formally Professor Pandya to deliver his talk. Yeah. <coughs> I, um, see, Professor Sunil Pandya is known to me for long. 
And I know his caliber and his uh, way of talking and his uh, knowledge about neurology as well as his neurosurgery. Uh, I don't want to spend much time, but I would ask Professor Sunil Pandya to deliver his speech. Sunil Pandya, please. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have my slides on now? Now? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Um, the topic is a huge topic and to cover the landmarks in the neurosciences is impossible in 30 minutes. So I'm going to restrict myself only to neurosurgery. And even there, I find that the task is rather daunting because to cover all the landmarks in such a short space of time, as you will yourself see as the talk goes on, is very, very difficult. Now, it's very important to recall Isaac Newton's statement, which I have reproduced on this slide, because that is very relevant to the next slide, which I'm going to show you. And I feel it's very important for all of us, particularly for our postgraduate students, to know first of all about the history of the neurosciences in their own city and in their own state. Uh, when we were conducting examinations in uh, neurosurgery, after the examination was over, I would often ask a student, this had nothing to do with the examination. Tell me about your department, the department in which you have studied. And very often I would be met with a blank stare. And I think this is a pity because you are learning from your teachers and it's important that you should know about your teachers about their work, about who taught them, the department in which you studied and so on. So I've just put one slide about the neurosciences in Kolkata, particularly with reference to neurosurgery. And I have uh, put some red arrows which depict key figures. And you will see that on the right side over here, we have Dr. R. N. Roy, uh, with Dr. Jacob Chandy, who was his teacher in Velour, and some of the other uh, students who were studying with Dr. Roy. That is my teacher, Dr. Vijendra Singh, that's Dr. Mathai, and so on. And on this slide, you will see a group photograph right here at the left side bottom. And this group photograph contains three interesting individuals. On the extreme left is a red arrow which shows Dr. Ashok Bakchi. In the middle is Dr. T.K. Ghosh. And on this side, we have Dr. R.N. Chatterjee. Uh, three of the stalwarts who started the neurosciences in Calcutta. And Dr. Ashok Bakchi, of course, all of you know very well, was a very eminent historian as well. And at the bottom right, I have put just three selected papers. I can't possibly put any more papers than that. And these are papers which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. The first one is Dr. R. N. Roy's Remembrances, his memoirs about neurosurgery as it was. And then there's Dr. Ambar Chakravarti. Uh, the title may seem very interesting, but uh, the topic as he develops it is equally fascinating. And then we have Dr. Kalyan Bhattacharya with his usual uh, very, very interesting uh, studies in aspects of the history of uh, the neurosciences, which very few people are interested in. And so in this particular paper, he discusses Adolf Hitler and his Parkinson's disease. I found Dr. Bhattacharya's papers uniformly interesting and I've been fascinated by them. In fact, I have a small collection of reprints which he kindly sent me at my request. Now, we cannot understand neurology or neurosurgery unless we understand anatomy and physiology. And these are some of the key personalities who advance anatomy and physiology. On the top left-hand corner, you have Andreas Vesalius, 
and Andreas Vesalius it was who broke the shackles in which neuroanatomy and anatomy in general was bound after the work of Claudius Galen. You will remember that Claudius Galen was a dominating figure in medicine and particularly in the field of anatomy for hundreds of years. And his statements were hardly ever challenged. Now, unfortunately, he had drawn many of his conclusions from dissection on animals. So his description of anatomy in human beings was actually an extrapolation of what he found in animals. And so he said that the human liver is multilobular, which is so in the pig, but not in the human being. He also said that at the base of the brain, there is a structure called the reti mirabili, which is there in animals, but not in human beings. And it was Andreas Pesalius who by his meticulous dissection on human beings showed that some of the points which had been made by Galen were not in keeping with what obtained in the human body. The person in the center is very well known for his work on the circulation of blood, William Harvey. And what is not very well known is that William Harvey by himself was a very good clinician and has done some research on the diseases of the nervous system. On the extreme right, we have Thomas Billis. And of course, all of you are very conversant with the circle of Billis at the base of the brain, but it's actually not a circle, it's a polygon, but by tradition, it has been called the circle of Billis. Willis himself was a clinician and Willis himself has also written papers on neurological diseases. And right at the bottom, we have this amazing figure, Santiago Cajal. And Cajal it was who brought microscopic anatomy of the nervous system into sharp focus. And he built upon earlier work to demonstrate with startling clarity neurons, axons, dendrites, and thereby set neuroanatomy and neurophysiology on a very firm footing. So these are four old masters of anatomy and physiology and of microscopic anatomy. Then we come to the clinical neurosciences. And these are some of the great clinical neuroscientists. Actually, they were great clinicians of medicine in general but they have also written about the neurosciences and these works are worth studying as well. Thomas Sydenham was called the British Hippocrates because he built on the work of the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates and set medicine on a very firm footing in the English speaking world of his time. And it was he who emphasized that you can learn medicine at the bedside. Now this emphasis was later on uh, reinvented, uh, shall we say, by this gentleman at the bottom, William Musler, and we'll come to him in a couple of minutes. In the middle is Pierre Louis. And Pierre Louis was the great French clinician of his time, working in Paris. Once again, an advocate of learning medicine at the bedside, and once again, a great advocate of symptoms and signs, the importance of taking a good history, the importance of maintaining excellent medical records, and so on and so forth. The person on the right, you may not be aware of, but for me, he's a very important person because he was the first professor of medicine at the medical college where I studied, which is the Grand Medical College and the JJ Hospital. And Charles Moorhead was respected in the English speaking world of that time as a master clinician, especially in tropical diseases. And he had written a book on the principles of practice of medicine with special focus on diseases which are found in India. And his writings in that book and in some papers on diseases such as tuberculous meningitis and remember, he was writing in the 1840s and 1850s. 
they are extraordinary. Once again, like Sydenham and Alexander, like Pierre Louis, he was an advocate of bedside medicine and learning at the bedside. Now today, if you ask anyone, who is the champion of bedside medicine, they will point to Sir William Osler, who is over here. But William Osler was a seven-year-old child when Charles Moorhead was teaching bedside medicine and the importance of learning at the bedside and the importance of clinical medicine when he, Osler was just a child. But Moorhead is not known, whereas Osler is recognized throughout the world as the great champion of bedside medicine. And the figure on the right at the bottom of this slide is William Gowers, who was knighted, and so he became Sir William Gowers. And Macdonald Critchley, who in his own right was a great neurophysician, has called him probably the greatest clinical neurologist of all time. And Macdonald Critchley also pointed out that Gowers' book on clinical neurology was something which should have been considered as the Holy Bible for all students of neurology and the neurosciences. And he also uttered a word of caution, McDonald Krishni. He said, when you think that you have found something new, you have discovered a new disease or some new thing, first go to Gower's book and chances are you will find the mention of what you think is new, either in the text or in the footnotes. So that was William Gowers, one of the great clinical neuroscientists of all time. Then we come to imaging, because we are so dependent on imaging. And uh, unfortunately for us, imaging is now almost replacing our clinical senses. This was a warning which had been sounded in the 1970s when CT scan came to Queen Square, it had been sounded by the neurophysician, I mean the neuroradiologist at Queen Square, Dr. George Dubure. And when he was teaching, he would say that I'm very sad that the CT scan has been invented. The CT scan had been invented just a couple of years ago. And for the first time ever, we were able to see the inside of the living brain thanks to the CT scan. And while Duboulet was fully aware of the benefits that were provided by the CT scan, he said, I'm very sorry that this has been invented because now clinical sciences will atrophy. And clinicians will now ask for the CT scan before examining their patients. And sadly, what he had predicted has come to pass. And ever so often we see clinicians neurologists, neurosurgeons, certainly general physicians, who, when they're faced with a patient who complains of neurological symptoms, first ask them to go and get a CT or MR before he comes to their clinic, which is very, very sad indeed. But to start from the beginning, at the beginning we have here on the extreme left, Wilhelm Röntgen, and Wilhelm Röntgen it was, who discovered x-rays and pointed out some of the possible uses of his new discovery in the field of medicine. And he was one of the first people to be awarded the Nobel Prize when the first set of Nobel Prizes was awarded in 1901. Röntgen was one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize. And as you will see here in this bunch of imaging experts, we see a number of Nobels. We have Röntgen Nobel, Igas Moniz Nobel. Of course, Igas Moniz got his Nobel not for angiography, which he had pioneered, but for his work on frontal lobotomy, which is a pity. And many people have since said very sadly that he should have got the Nobel for angiography and not for his work on lobotomy. Then we have another Nobel here, Werner Forsman. And Werner Forsman, you will remember, is the first person to introduce a catheter. And he put the catheter through an anti-cubital vein and took it right into the heart. 
And if you are not aware of his very first experiment, which was on himself, I would strongly recommend that you read it because it is an inspiration. The manner in which he cheated the nurse who was in the ward and got the catheter, how he inserted the catheter into his vein and pushed it inside. It was a ureteric catheter and walked from the place where he had inserted the catheter, the room in which he had inserted the catheter to the x-ray machine with the help of the nurse whom he had promised that she would be the first person in whom he would put the catheter instead of which he put it into himself. And then how the x-ray was taken, which showed the catheter in the heart. And that was the birth of percutaneous angiography using catheters. Walter Dandy, why is he amongst the imaging experts? Because Walter Dandy, apart from all his superb surgical work, was the person who brought ventriculography into practice. And the use of air in the nervous system, the introduction of air into the subarachnoid spaces and into the ventricles, and the movement of air in the ventricles for the first time allowed any clinician to see the interior of the brain through the ventricles. And of course, their expertise on ventriculography was such, and that was passed on to all their students and postgraduates and their academic descendants, so much so that even when I was studying my neurosciences in 1965, 66, 67, prehistoric times, Ventriculography was one of the key investigations that were used for the diagnosis and localization of brain tumors. And that is Walter Dandy, and that is why Walter Dandy is among the imaging experts. Jeff Godfrey Hounsfield, of course, all of you are very well aware of his contribution, the CT scanner. And these two, Lotter Buer and Mansfield, got their Nobel Prize for magnetic resonance imaging. So you see the number of Nobels, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six Nobels amongst individuals who contributed to neuroimaging. Now we come to surgery proper. And as I told you, unless you know your anatomy and your pathology, you cannot be a surgeon. Certainly you cannot be a good surgeon. And one of the first persons ever, excuse me, one of the first persons ever to emphasize that anatomy and pathology were crucial to becoming a good surgeon was the Scottish surgeon John Hunter. And he lived, as you can see, in the 18th century. His elder brother, William, was an obstetrician and gynecologist. And both of them established schools of anatomy, and they taught anatomy. John Hunter went on to pioneer investigation and experimentation in the understanding of disease. And he went on to found what was probably one of the finest museums in Great Britain, which is today the Hunterian Museum in the Royal College of Surgeons. John Hunter. Inya Semmelweis is the one who taught, who taught us that it is doctors who can pass on disease from one patient to another. And he did that in the Vienna of his time, where he showed that obstetricians and obstetric postgraduate students who went to the autopsy room to see what the patient had died of and then came straight to the lying in room, the delivery room, and delivered patients without even washing their hands. And therefore, they conveyed puerperal fever to, to mothers who were delivering babies with an appalling mortality. And Semmelweis showed by the simple method of washing your hands before you conduct a delivery, 
you could cut down the mortality by a huge percentage. That was Inyas Semmelweis who emphasized how we can infect our patients when we treat them, and especially during maneuverings, during delivery, and of course, during surgery. And this lesson struck Joseph Lister, and Joseph Lister set up the carbolic spray in his operation theater, which cut down infection of wounds in the operation theater significantly. Joseph Lister, of course, had done much more. There are many more contributions which he has made, but his, his one of the important contributions is that he brought down infection in the surgical operation theater. Because before his time, surgeons would infect wounds and those would either cause severe morbidity or mortality. William Morton, why is William Morton in the category of surgery, because it was William Morton who used nitrous oxide as anesthesia. And so he ushered in the field of anesthesia without which modern neurosurgery would be impossible. And that is why William Morton deserves a place amongst the pioneers of surgery. And on the extreme right bottom, you have Alexander Fleming, who also got his Nobel Prize and all of you know very well Alexander Fleming's major contribution to surgery, which was the development of the first antibiotic ever, penicillin. And of course, after that, we've had a whole slew of antibiotics. And we are, in fact, now in an era where we are misusing antibiotics with antibiotic resistance. But was Alexander Fleming's penicillin which saved innumerable lives during the World War, when war casualties with appalling wounds, amputations, facial injuries, and so on, they were, they, were, they were saved from getting infected by the use of this antibiotic, which Fleming had discovered. Now we come to neurosurgery proper. And in neurosurgery proper, there's a galaxy. I have chosen a few, but you may have some other choices. So if you were asked to give this lecture, you may choose some other neurosurgeon, which would be quite fair. The first that I have chosen is Victor Horsley. And Victor Horsley is, again, another surgeon who deserves acclaim for his emphasis on experimentation, animal experimentation and other experimentation in advancing surgery. Horsley, of course, is famous for his first ever operation on the brain tumors. And then Horsley's wax and so on and so forth. Incidentally, just before Horsley died in 1916, he visited India. He was at that time working with the British Army in the Middle East. And he came to India, he visited India. He actually gave a lecture at my alma mater at the Grand Medical College. And he went back to the theater of operations in the army and then developed sunstroke and perhaps typhoid fever and died over there. I don't think we need to talk about Harvey Cushing. I don't think we need to talk about Walter Dandy because these are very, very eminent figures, and I'm sure you probably know as much as I do about these two gigantic figures. And similarly, Wilder Penfield on the right side, the Canadian neurosurgeon who set up the Montreal Neurological Institute, which remains an outstanding institute, but which in his days was a mecca to which individuals came to learn neurosurgery from all over the world, including from India. And from India, we had Dr. Jacob Chandy and Dr. Ram Murthy, both of whom you see at the bottom right. And then we have Dr. Prakash Chandan, and we had Dr. D.R. Gulati from Chandigarh, Dr. Vijay Dave, who eventually settled down in Lucknow as a neurosurgeon and professor. So, so many of them went to Wilder Penfield's Institute to learn neurosurgery. On the bottom right, we have Dr. Ryasar Gil. And next to him is Dr. Sugita. And both these are hallowed names in the history of surgery 
of intracranial vascular malformations, aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, and so on. Professor Sugita, unfortunately, is no more, but Professor Yasser Gil is living in America in retirement and has made contributions which are unforgettable. Dr. Jacob Chandy, as you know, founded Neurosurgery in India, and he set up the first neurosurgical center at the Christian Medical College, Bellore. And as we saw on an earlier slide, Dr. R. N. Roy and Dr. Bajendra Singh and Dr. Dharkar and Dr. Mathai and Abraham, of course, were Dr. Jacob Chandy's students. Um, Dr. Chandy had created a school of neurosurgeons who in turn went on to train so many other neurosurgeons. Dr. B. Ramamurti was his counterpart in Madras, not very far from Bellore. And Dr. Ramamurti set up the Institute of Neurology in Madras, which was unrivaled at its peak. Unfortunately, the Institute of Neurology today is just a shadow of what it was at its heydays. And uh, Dr. Ramamurti trained uh, not only neurology and uh, neurosurgeons, but he also had a team of neurologists in that Institute of Neurology. We had Dr. Arjun Das and Dr. Jagannathan and uh, so many others in Madras who trained in the Institute which Dr. Ramamurti has set up. So these are all great individuals in the field of um, neurosciences. I would now like to close this talk because I think I'm nearing the end of the time allotted to me by talking about three maverick neurosurgeons. The term maverick is used to describe some, someone who thinks in a very unusual manner, sometimes eccentric and sometimes even dangerous. And we have three individuals that I've chosen from the field of neurosurgery. On the left side, we have Walter Freeman. And Walter Freeman was the prime exponent of lobotomy of his time. And he performed countless lobotomies. Um, many of you will have read the book and perhaps seen the movie also, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest which shows one of the disastrous complications of lobotomy. And there were many others who suffered very severe debilitating neurological abnormalities, almost becoming vegetables. And the lobotomy had been performed merely because they were unruly patients, difficult to manage and difficult to handle. And so lobotomy was done and then they became quiet vegetables with no initiative, with no enthusiasm, more or less sitting in a corner or lying on a bed with no life, no productivity after that. In the center, we have Dr. Robert White. And Dr. Robert White is a very, very interesting person. He was a follower of the Russian neurosurgeon who transplanted a head from one dog to another. And Robert White was inspired by that and actually carried out experiments to check whether we could transplant one human head to another human being. There is no recorded But Dr. Arjun Segal, who is unfortunately no more, but who was a prominent neurosurgeon in Delhi was in Robert White's laboratory when Robert White was doing these experiments. And he told us that yes, Robert White was experimenting on transplanting human heads, but he never got around to transplanting a live person's human head from one individual to another. He did his experiments on dogs and those experiments on dogs had results which were not uniform. They sort of kept on changing depending on what experiment he had done. Now, Robert White appears to have inspired another neurosurgeon who is still alive, Sergio Cavanero. 
And Sergio Cavanero has been threatening the whole world that he is going to be the first person to transplant a human head from a diseased individual, take off the head of a diseased individual and put on the head of a person who's got a relatively normal brain. He says that he has mastered the technique of anastomosing the spinal cord, which is the, according to him, is the key to the success of this operation. And initially he said he was going to do this operation in the 1990s. And then he said he was going to do the operation in 1920 something. And now the current stand is that he's going to do this operation in, 19, in the 2030s. So I don't know whether he will ever do it. And certainly I would be very, very surprised if that operation had any chance of success whatsoever. But he says that he is competent, capable, and he promises to do it in 2030. Now, Robert White, you know, you might wonder why should a guy, why should a neurosurgeon want to go ahead and transplant a human head from one in live individual to another live individual, given the various problems that people face? And that at the moment, we have no means of repairing even a broken spinal cord. So how are we going to repair an entire brain with a spinal cord by transplanting one head to another? And so you wonder what made Robert White enter into this very, very difficult area. And I found a clue the other day in a paper which Robert White wrote in 1998. And he has made this statement, which I have put over here at the bottom. It says, no neurosurgeon had been honored with a Nobel Prize. Surely one or more investigators who are engaged in important research deserve candidacy. And my own feeling is that Robert White considered himself as a ripe candidate to be awarded the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, he died without any such prize being awarded to him. And I've given you one reference at the bottom of uh, a young neurosurgeon who has written a book on scalpel mavericks. And you might like to have a look at that uh, book. So I'm going to end by summarizing what I've just said over the past half an hour or so. And that is that the neurosciences have a hallowed past. They started with Hippocrates who himself has written about the brain and about how consciousness is derived from the brain when people believe that the brain was a useless organ and the heart was the most important organ in the body. And at that time, Hippocrates had said, it is from the brain and from the brain alone that consciousness, thoughts, ideas, everything comes. So this was in ancient Greece. And then we have neurophysicians, we have anatomists, physiologist, pathologist, and then, of course, the great clinical neuro uh, neurophysicians and neurosurgeons, the imaging specialists, and then the developments in neurosurgery. Uh, I'm sure you will, you, would, you will have to read a lot uh, to be able to gain much more information on each of these individuals whom we should learn to respect and honor. Thank you very much. Amazing and fantastic journey through history. Professor Manoj Bhattacharya, can we bring you in for your comments on these, this amazing journey and your opinion of some of these stalwarts that Professor Pandya has so beautifully uh, showcased in his talk? Manoj, sir? Yes, uh, <laughs> I agree with you that Neil Paniaza has brought us some of the most important uh, aspect, both from uh, laboratory uh, to the uh, field of uh, craftsmanship. It's certainly 
uh, we must look forward for the uh, furthermore announcing uh, episode that he will deliver to us uh, in future lectures. Thank you. Monuzda, I'm going to ask you, tell me three events that you think shaped modern neurosurgery from the time you were a trainee to now. Three events that occurred in India or abroad. Tell me choose three events that you think had a great bearing on how modern neurosurgery is practiced today from the time you were a trainee to now. Uh, when I was training, uh, we had to uh, depend on a monopolar diatomy, a operating theater, uh, a OT table, and uh, some of the uh, gadgets recently discovered. But since then, I would say that the first thing which came to us is the microscope, operating microscope and microsurgery. Then the, what I call is to some sense uh, term that the tumor, uh, people is walking with the uh, tumor in his hand. That means that the, at that time, the CT scan and later on, I must say that the MRI, uh, which has the distinct sub uh, important discovery and which made us uh, work safely and find uh, confidence in the operating table. But by subsequently, there are others which came forward. And I think these three are most important. That the operating microscope, CT scan, and MRI. Fantastic. Thank you. Koshik, you have any questions before uh, we bring Professor Kulyan Bhattabhattacharya in? No, not till now. I'll go back. I'll come back. Okay, Kolanda, let's go to Professor Kolyan Bhattacharya, who's done an astounding amount of research on, uh, on the history of neurosciences. Uh, Thank you, Tell Sanjeev. us what you think. Let, Kolanda, I just want you to tell us the names of four neurologists that you think have made a huge impact to the practice of neuromedicine today and indeed on your life. Well, the first person I would like to name is Jama Tashako. To me, he is the greatest neurophysician ever born. There's not a single aspect of neuromedicine which he hasn't touched upon. I will not dwell more on him because it's by, him, by himself is a chapter. Two, number two, together, side by side, Hughes Jackson and Sir William Gallus, side by side. One was the registrar for the other. In, 19, in 1870, William Gallus was appointed as the first registrar to Queen Square. And in 1862, uh, Hughes Jackson was appointed as an assistant professor to Queen Square. But for historical importance, I would say that the first physician ever appointed in Queen Square was uh, Brown Secker in 1861. Third person I would like to quote is Kinney Wilson. He is the father of basal ganglia research. It's not my statement, it's a statement from the legendary Professor Charles David Marsden, and still living, fortunately, supposed to come to India. I invited him in 2021, 23rd of June, for an international meeting, but everything went here where. Professor Stanley Fan, they said that Wilson is the father of basal ganglia research, and we all stand on his shoulders. And number four, and mind you, without any bias, I tell you, the genius of neurology is David Marston himself. He has turned movement disorders, he had given it a new luster, a new color, a new definition. The entire spectrum of dystonia, which was thought to be psychogenic in origin, 
He proved incontrovertibly that it's an organic disorder. And there is not a single branch in movement disorders where he didn't leave his indelible impact and mark. And today in this world, at least there are 50 international experts on movement disorders who were all his fellows. But these are the four that immediately they come to my mind who are really great in the field of neuromedicine. What about uh, telling us a little bit about, in your opinion, who were the people that shaped neuro neurology in this country? Well, it might be invidious for me to name a couple because certain others will be missed. So that's the problem. So if many of you perhaps know that I wrote a book, uh, Eminent Neuroscientists, where I wanted to include the name of Professor Noshir Wadia. But in the preface I wrote, but I will not include anybody who is alive internationally because that might create some problems. Noshi Wadia, number one, number one, number two, number three, four, and five. Number two, Gauri Devi. Many, many remarkable works he has done. Number three, you see, these two are past the part. Professor B. S. Sinhal, in his own way, the first fan to identify multiple sclerosis in India with Professor Dharab Dastur in 1985. And after that, it's very difficult to say that many, many people who have done remarkable jobs, remarkable works, but Suril Pradhan from Lucknow SGPGI, even in these days, could describe a number of signs which are now named after him, Pradhan's sign in muscular dystrophy. If you go by the, by the, by the criterion of of, of describing a sign which goes by an eponym. It's otherwise, I, I mean, there are plenty, there are plenty who have made an indelible mark in international neurology. Professor Pandya, I'm going to ask you a question. You talked about Harvey Cushing and um, Walter Dandy. And all through our training periods and all uh, during our study of neurosurgery, we've been told that these were the two stalwarts of neurosurgery but they were completely different in their attitude to neurosurgery. How do you think they were different? And uh, who do you think really made more contribution to the future of neuroscience? I know this is a difficult question uh, and a debatable one, but I just want your opinion. No, it's a very interesting question. And in fact, there are papers, several papers, which have been written on the Cushing Dandy controversies. And uh, there is a similar kind of uh, controversy between Walter Pen uh, Wilder Penfield and his assistant, uh, who in fact died while he was working in the hospital in the Montreal. So there are two of these coupled neurosurgeons uh, who had controversy. But to come to your question about Cushing and Dandy, there are those individuals who claim that Dandy was the more prolific of the two that Dandy worked not only in neurosurgery, but also in the field of neuroradiology. That Dandy described aneurysms when angiography was in its infancy. That Dandy's book, which is called The Brain, which was actually a part of a surgical compendium, is even today a work which is worthy of study. Dandy's work on hydrocephalus, uh, with the Dandy Walker syndrome and many other uh, contributions which he made. So it appears that Dandy at least was as good as Cushing. And some people claim that he was even better. But Cushing was the dominating figure in that area. And uh, Cushing, with his uh, polish and with his seniority, and with his connections, reign supreme. So there are those who feel that Dante got a raw deal and uh, that Cushing should have treated him much better than he did. Shundeep. Yes. No, I don't, I don't have the temerity of using the word, my comments. I would use uh, softer words. I have some observations on what Professor Pandya has said. Professor. Please go ahead, go ahead. Can I? Well, sir, I would just, I've jotted them down. I just want to uh, mention a few points. Uh, 
after your most illuminating talk, this might be of no relevance anymore. Nonetheless, Sinham, uh, he was a uh, anti-royalist. He was very much against Charles I, and he was a very close friend of Oliver Cromwell. And so he had to leave. He left his studies at All Souls Fellow uh, College, All Souls College in the, uh, at, at, at Oxford. And he uh, later, he joined the college after the restoration of monarchy in 1860. And he studied with his son to complete his studies. And most importantly, he is the first man, the first, Europe, first textbook, I'm sorry, the first movement disorder that was ever described in the world, in the English speaking world, I mean, it was described in India, Parkinson's disease, 1500 BC. I'm writing on that for a journal. He describes Sydenham's career in 1686, which is the first script of the movement disorders in the world. Coming to Osler, sir, I will tell you one thing. Um, of course, it was expected of you. You were the only person I've heard so far in my life to pronounce his name as Osler. As a matter of fact, he himself wrote that my name is not Osler, it's Osler. That's uh, something I must, uh, I must uh, make a point of. Gowers, what you said, indeed, the Bible of Neurology, his textbook, there are two volumes published in 1886 and 1888, well, I have read those in medical college, being the oldest college in Asia. We have the copies of that. I went through them. Uh, he wrote so exhaustively that it's sometimes said that whenever Gavas was in a confusion, he would only refer to his own manuscript, his own book, not any other reference if he was in a sort of confusion. And coming to... Um, Hounsfield, yes. Hounsfield first, I have written about these people in the book as well as some isolated papers, which Professor Pali had been alluding to. His first experiment was on a goat's brain, which he hired or rather purchased from butcher's shop, which showed the imaging of the brain. But one very interesting fact about Hounsfield is that he's the only Nobel laureate in the world who didn't have a degree. He was a diploma holder working in the EMI. And there was quite a lot of human cry after receiving the Nobel Prize that how can a person who is not even an MSc or a BSc get a Nobel Prize? But that was dismissed because of the impact of his work coming to Horsley. It's unthinkable that Joseph Babinski clinically diagnosed, as Sir was alluding to, clinical neurology. He identified precisely at which level there was a neurofibroma in the spine, in the spinal cord, I mean, in a patient, and which Horsley operated upon. And exactly at the same level, he got it. Unthinkable clinical acumen of Babinski. And uh, the last word I will say about is that uh, Sir, I have a question to you. Why don't in your list of mavericks, you don't include, as Shundit had been saying, Dandy's name? Because I have written on Dandy, I have written on Cushing in, Neuro in the Neurology India, and also in my book, what I understand, very limited understanding of neurosurgery, non-existent understanding, you could say. But Dandy was a bit of a uh, too dashing, and too, uh, too confident a surgeon who used to pull out everything from the brain, whereas Cushing operated precisely on what was necessary to debunk. Uh, his whole attitude, Dandy, what I realized is was, he was truly a maverick. He, he went too much ahead in terms of surgery. Your comment, sir. I think I agree with that because Dandy was prone to believe that uh, tumors are there to be removed and uh, that tumors can be removed and should be removed. So he was one of the first to remove the entire acoustic nerve tumor. Uh, the fact that the patient was left with any neurological deficits was, of course, a different matter as far as he was concerned. 
And there's a, there's a very interesting anecdote about Sir William Osler and his name. This very question was put to him, to Osler himself. Sir, should we call you Osler or should we call you Osler or what should we call you? So he's saying, if you just say a simple hi, it's enough. You don't need to use my name. Just say hi and I will respond. So. Professor Pandya, I'm going to ask you a question which is a little deviation from neurosciences. But one of your articles I was fascinated by was an article which you wrote called Books from My Shelf. Yes. And you wrote extensively, about, I know in that, about Sir Jeffrey Jefferson. And um, as a neurosurgeon who spent a lot of his training life in the city of Manchester, in the very operation theater that Sir Jeffrey Jefferson designed, I was really amazed at the depth of that article. But what really I want to know from you is you quote there a book from Arthur Conan Doyle called Through the Magic Door. I want you to tell us and the viewers what, this, what is this book about and what is so intriguing about Through the Magic Door. This is an amazing book. I actually read it after I read your article. This is an amazing book. Uh, you know, when you talk of Arthur Conan Doyle, the image that enters your uh, imagination immediately is that of Sherlock Holmes. And so you say Arthur Conan Doyle, oh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. <clears throat> but Arthur Conan Doyle has written about so many other things. He's written historical novels, for instance, about British history. Novels, not history, but historical novels on, on, on British past. This book, Through the Magic Door, is most unusual. And uh, it is very important for us to know about this book, to get the book and to read it. Fortunately, this book is available on the internet. <clears throat> so if you just enter through the magic door, you can download the entire book from the internet. And in this book, <clears throat> it is as if he was holding your hand as an elder brother and taking you through what he calls the magic door. The magic door is the door to his library. So he's taking you through his magic door into his library. And then he tells you that once you come through this magic door, all the cares of the world disappear. There's nothing which is urgent. There's nothing which is, must be done immediately. And here he says, you have rank after rank of all your old friends, your trusted friends, your beloved friends, who, are, who have been with you for many, many years. And many of them are long dead, but they remain your friends and they will continue to enlighten you, to amuse you, to inspire you. And then he talks about some of his books, which uh, are there in his library. It's an astonishing book. And at the end of the book, he takes you out through the magic door into the real world. And he says, you know, that was just the world of shadows. Now we are coming back into the real world where the telephone will ring and the urgent summons will come and you are now returning to the hustle and bustle of life. But aren't you glad that you spent some time through the magic door in that magic environment? It's a beautiful book, and I'm very glad that you remembered that book and you brought it up. I, I really think everybody should read that book. It is such an amazing book, and thank you, because you were the first person to get me to read that book. I didn't know very much about that book before. And right. Professor so Manoj Bhattacharya, do you want to make some final comments, and Kolanda, some final comments before yes, Oshin Yes, one word I will say, if you permit me. Coming to uh, Thomas Willis, a very fascinating story. I'm sure that Professor Pandya knows it and many of you might be knowing this. This question of circular Willis, how did it come? How, how was it discovered? See, Thomas Willis, as opposed to Thomas Sydenham, was an ardent royalist. So after the restoration of monarchy, the Royal Society was the nucleus was formed in the Wharton College in Oxford, where I was privileged to stay for one night in the hostel. Uh, it was the Christopher Wren, who was the chairman, rebuilt the burnt 
uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in 1866, with which the plague in London was completely controlled. So that's the reason they say that God is an Englishman. Nothing, nothing destroys London. Now, uh, what happened is that Thomas Willis did an autopsy on a person who had a hemiplegia. And what he found is that that person's one side, the carotid artery, was completely blocked by a thrombus. Yet the patient didn't have a stroke. How was it possible? It intrigued him. So he went inside and he found that there is a collateral circulation under the brain from which he deduced that it's the other side carotid which was supplying the brain. And so he dissected the brain in great detail and discovered the circle. Fascinating story. I think what's amazing is that the individuals who were working at that time, in that period, had no access to any of the things which we consider commonplace. Absolutely, no sir. No CT, no MR, no contrast CT, no contrast MR. And yet, they contributed so immensely to our understanding. Yes, sir. This brings me to another. If you see, this is an endless discussion because you see, I, I eat, I drink, I sleep. History on many subjects, which Shondita and Manoj are perhaps would be knowing. So this brings me to another small story. I will tell you. Sharko, Sharko got a lady as his maid, who was having a stamping gate. It was a stamping gate going on. He had abdominal crisis, laryngeal crisis, so on and so forth, and he couldn't make out what he was, she was suffering from. He followed her, and he got the history that this lady had primary syphilis once upon a time. He didn't dismiss her from service. He followed her for 17 years, and after she died, he did an autopsy on her at Salpatrier Hospital. And you observe that the posterior column was wasted. And that's how the term tabies dorsalis, wasting of the dorsal part, came into use. And that is his classic clinical anatomical method of diagnosis, which we are now following the reverse way. We are doing the clinical study. We are seeing an Argyle Robertson pupil. We are seeing posterior joint sense loss, this loss, that loss, stamping gait. So we think, therefore, the posterior column must be involved. It's the reverse way we are now thinking, but Sharko went the other way around. First diagnosed, observed pathologically, wasting, and so he concluded that this is the site. So he, he had no access to anything else. He didn't have an MRI to show that the posterior column was wasted. Isn't it, sir? Yes, very much so. Uh, ah. Tell me, who is the neurologist, the British neurologist, who, were, who entered his hospital clinic mm. and then his registrar was standing there and watching him. Mm. And then he, the registrar was particularly looking at his gait mm. and he had that stamping gait. Mm. And this neurologist noted that that registrar had noticed his abnormal gait, uh, which was a Tibetic gait. Mm -hmm. And he told the registrar, my dear chap, I think I have taught you neurology all too well because he realized that his registrar knew what his disease was. But the registrar diagnosed his syphilis. It, it means that, sir. I don't know the story. I don't know who it was. Okay. Who was it, sir? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to, I remember, but I can't remember. But <laughs> I, I remember that this very senior neurologist realized that his registrar knew what his diagnosis was by observing his gait. And he said, I see that I've taught you neurology too well. Not neurology, sir, clinical neurology. I, am, I consider myself nothing but a devotee in the temple of clinical neurology. I don't care much for MRI or CT. Certainly, as you said, it has helped us, as Manojda had been saying, one of the greatest discoveries, indeed, inventions rather, Great invention, great invention. It has helped the students, uh, helped the patients so much. But to me, 
I still belong to the domain of clinical medicine. Yes, which is very sadly atrophying now. Absolutely, absolutely. They look at the CT first and then they go to see the patient. And I always used to tell them, please don't do me right, but do me, don't come to me. Manojda, your final comment. Oh, uh, and one more problem, sir, in recent days, when I am lecturing, I'm teaching in bedside, I find the students opening the Google and whatever I have said, they're going to the disease. And one day I was livid with rage. I told him, you see, you have two options. If you want to learn from me, you have to mute, you have to just, just mute your this uh, whatever. And listen to me. Otherwise, you are at liberty to leave and read the Google. Then don't come to me. Choice is yours. Yes, history of neuroscience is as interesting as one a surgeon who finds pleasure in removing a total removal of an acoustic tumor. <laughs> <laughs> it is so fascinating. And you go on talking hours after hours and you find a so, so nice enjoyment throughout your course of discussion. And I'm fine, Professor Sunil Pandya and Professor Kulanwata Bhattacharya is discussing such a fascinating and intertopic discussion. Sunil is a surgeon and Kalan is a neurologist and they're talking on the same language in the same wavelength. I'm <laughs> really fascinated <laughs> and I must thank both of them and, and I remark this is an excellent, excellent of uh, topics that has been chosen by Sandeep and Dr. Kofix. Thank you very much. Yes, I don't sir. want to. Very well spent to... evening. Very well spent evening. Do you want to give your final comments and then close? No, no, there's a question on Charles Balance in the chat box. Belinda, you want to talk Charles about Balance? Charles Balance, I already know about his Balance's sign that I would request one in Pandya, Professor Pandya, to come and talk it. No, I think you're more competent than me to talk about this. So I, I, I'd, I'd like to listen to you. No, sir, I'm not very <laughs> well conversant with Charles Balance, except his balance aside that, uh, that uh, behind the ear, the blood, whatever, abrasion or whatever in a posterior fossa trauma. That's my mind. That's the limit of my understanding about Charles Balance. I haven't read about him. Yes, he described that uh, collection of blood, which was an indicator of a fracture in the region of the posterior fossa mastoid area, uh, and therefore an indicator of a very serious head injury, like but not just a minor head injury where you could, uh, I mean, the patient now needed to be looked after much, much more carefully, balance his side. Uh, Sandeep, oh. Yeah, do you know Charles Balance and Victor Horsley were classmates from St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And if you remember that first spinal tumor that Victor Horsley removed way back in 1887, Charles Valence was his assistant in that operation. So in fact, Victor Horsley and Charles Valence removed that spinal tumor together, although all the credit goes to Victor Horsley and somehow Charles Valence's name has been forgotten. And Sandeep, is there anything to do with a splenic rupture and Valence's sign? Pass. My knowledge below the diaphragm is not very good. <laughs> but once upon a time, you were the class assistant of surgery. I, have, I haven't forgotten that. And you got the gold as well. That was when dinosaurs roamed the planet. Gochi, <laughs> all yours. So, as neurosurgery students, we only know, uh, read about Vesalius, uh, Dandy, Cushing's, Kiari. And it was a, all of us were in a oblivion about this neurosurgical legacies of these great persons both in India and abroad. So today our vision has definitely opened to this hetero unknown uh, vista. 
and thank you professor pandya from the core of our heart for providing such an illuminating lecture i hope neurosurgeons all who are, who are listening will be greatly enriched by your talk i also take this opportunity to thank professor bhatcharya both professor kollan bhatcharya and professor manoj bhatcharya for the wonderful discussion and lastly we want to thank professor sandeep chatterjee for conceptualizing this wonderful topic which was one of the least touched topic while doing a say mch or a dnp course and on behalf of all those listening i thank all of you again for this wonderful evening so over thank to you Deepak. sir thank you sir i am enriched by your knowledge sir uh, we would like to thank all the neuroscientists who viewed this program uh, professor sunil pandya opened the magic door of the history of neurosciences and professor k bhatacharya and professor mk bhatacharya opened the, the windows of the history of neurosciences and took us to the wonderful journey of neurosciences history on which the modern neurosciences is based on uh, thank you very much professor uh, sandeep chatterjee for conceptualizing this wonderful thought of taking the young neuroscientists of today to this magic door of the historical relevance and uh, 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 kaushik sil sir for coordinating this uh, wonderful session so on behalf of health and you and dj neuro we would like to thank all the young neuroscientists and would like to inform the the audience that three colleges joined us today in live viewing of this program kgmu lucknow banaras hindu university banaras and rajeshwari hospital with their department and all the uh, the registrar and uh, senior uh, and junior neurologists so thank you very much this is deepak naik on behalf of health and you signing off and uh, uh, sir you would like to announce for the next topic now or we will inform them later oshik can i inform about the next topic i will inform later because i don't have it in the hands i'll tell you the next topic next thursday we're going to discuss the normal embryological development of the spinal cord and what can go wrong and i'm afraid i am that i am the speaker you'll have to listen to and kindly send me the link as well i will i would love to listen to it will do sir that will be a great opportunity for us to listen to professor nick chatterjee and on that note of uh, uh, informing me that you tune in next thursday 7:30 pm this is deepak naik signing off from health and you thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to carry this webinar yes sir thank you thank so you much all. Good thank you all good night to everybody thank you thank you <clears throat> Thank you Manoj da